summer can be a bit of a slog. For us, it's often for some reason a rather busy time, and I'm sure we're not alone. Well, you can beat the summertime sadness and the August angst and enhance your everyday with our excellent sponsor, Via Hemp. This is a company that crafts award-winning premium THC and THC-free gummies. Each of these gummies is especially designed to cultivate a specific mood. Whether you're looking to get relaxed, get quality sleep, get creative, or just to get focused. If you're 21 or older, you can experience it for yourself and get 15% off your first order with our exclusive code MSHEET at ViaHemp.com. That's V-I-I-A-H-E-M-P.com. I personally enjoyed their grapefruit flow state gummies. This CBG and CBD powerhouse really helped me tap into my productivity. Like, we have had an extremely busy summer, and I feel Flow State got me over the finish line a few times. When I was editing multiple episodes a day, digging through documents, and knocking out a bunch of interviews. Biohemp does not require a medical card, and it ships legally to all 50 states. It's also affordable, and even more so for Murder Sheet listeners who get a special deal. If you're 21 and older, head to viahemp.com and use code MSHEET to receive 15% off. That's V-I-I-A-H-E-M-P dot com and use code MSHEET at checkout. After you purchase, they ask you where you heard about them. Please support our show and tell them we sent you. Enhance your everyday with Via. Achieving a gorgeous grin from home isn't a total mystery with Bite Clear Aligners. Just don't be surprised if all of your sleuthing friends start asking, what's your secret? Begin by ordering your at-home impression kit today for only $14.95. Bite Clear Aligners are doctor-directed and delivered to your door. Treatment costs thousands less than braces. Plus, they offer flexible financing, accept eligible insurance, and you can pay with your HSA FSA. Get 80% off your impression kit when you use code WONDERY at Byte.com. That's B-Y-T-E dot com. Start your confidence journey today with Byte. This episode is sponsored by AutoTrader. Credit scores, down payments, interest rates. Car buying can be a numbers game, but you don't have to be a math expert to get the keys to your dream car. Just use Kelly Blue Book My Wallet on AutoTrader. Crunch your numbers and get your personalized results so you know exactly how much you'll pay each month for your car. It's like having a magic wand for your wallet. Presto, the car you've been wanting is now within reach. So hit the road and leave your calculator at home. Find your next car on autotrader.com. Content warning, this episode contains discussion of violence, suicide, and the murder of two girls. There always seems to be quite a bit of noise within the online community devoted to the Delphi case. Several internet commentators and sleuths who have devoted themselves to this case have actually ended up losing jobs or relationships because of their deep interest. Others have engaged in threats, stalking, and other forms of harassing or disturbing behavior because they are convinced of the existence of a conspiracy or because they feel only they can solve the mystery. As a rule, of course, we do not cover any of that noise unless we feel it has a direct impact on the underlying case itself. Frankly, we think we have a pretty decent record of predicting what players and events will turn out to have larger ramifications. And today, we will talk about yet another situation that we believe could have a big impact. In our December episode, The Delphi Murders, The Unacceptable, we profiled the Unraveling YouTube channel, which at the time was made up of Paul Mannion, Angela Sidlowski, and Courtney Parsons. As we discuss in this and the other episodes we are releasing today, that group had clear ties to the team defending Richard Allen in the Delphi murders case. Since we aired that episode, the Unraveling channel has undergone a dramatic change. Paul Mannion, the owner of the channel, locked Sidlowski and Parsons out of the channel. There's been quite a bit of speculation as to why he would take such a dramatic step. Today, he will join us to explain his thinking. In the past, we have had our disagreements with Paul. He's had his disagreements with us. But lately, we've gotten to discussing the case with him. It's been refreshing. We now know that Paul shares values that we also think are really important. A commitment to truth and transparency, for instance. That is why he is speaking out about some of the troubling behind-the-scenes behaviors in the case. Paul saw something that started with good intentions go wrong, and he wants to speak out about that. 
He's taking a stand, despite the fact that he envisions he will receive retribution and retaliation for blowing the whistle. Paul is candid regarding his belief that viewing true crime as entertainment is fine, as long as you worked out strict boundaries and a commitment to the facts, in order to ensure you don't cross any lines. In this episode, Paul would talk about his own thoughts on the crime and some of the activities that went on behind the scenes. In particular, he shared with us his understanding of the relationship between Sodlowski, Parsons, and Matt Hoffman. Hoffman is a man who works with Richard Allen's defense team in an investigatory capacity. Along the way, we touch on some other matters. We discuss how Paul created the Delphi Nut subreddit, looking for a place to discuss theories of the case. We briefly mentioned the so-called DP theory, which essentially was the incorrect idea that a man with those initials was the killer of Abby and Libby. Later, of course, some participants in that subreddit expressed belief in a different theory, namely one that implicated Ron Logan for the murders. Logan was the man who owned the land upon which the bodies were found. Since then, of course, much online discussion of the case on the defense side has switched to the theory put out by Rosie and Baldwin that the murders were actually committed by a group of Odinists, even though Holder is known to have been at work at the time of the murders. Meanwhile, as for the unraveling crew, Sidlowski has apparently been to Indiana twice. The first time was when she and Mannion were filmed for a CW documentary that aired earlier this year, and the second time was when she and Parsons appeared at a low-quality, low-turnout protest for Richard Allen, which they called the Groundswell. There is quite a cast of characters in this story. In addition to Hoffman, we also will be discussing Michael Osbrook, who is an attorney in the case representing Allen's defense attorneys, Andrew Baldwin and Bradley Rosie. We will also talk about how Osbrook, Bob Mata, Kara Wynicki, Nicole Miller, Sadlowski, and Parsons came together to form a private Twitter group they called the Due Process Gang, and how, for Paul, that group ended up demonstrating how little the people involved truly understood the case. My name is Anya Kane. I'm a journalist. And I'm Kevin Greenlee. I'm an attorney. And this is The Murder Sheet. We're a true crime podcast focused on original reporting, interviews, and deep dives into murder cases. We're The Murder Sheet. And this is The Delphi Murders, The Secret Messages of the Delphi Defense's Brain Trust, Part 3. A conversation with Paul Mannion on truth and true crime. Could you tell us a bit about yourself? Yeah, so like, uh, <laughs> I guess the way I would really want to kind of talk about myself is sort of like, like an Odyssean sort of way of just saying like, I am nobody. Uh, just because I feel that approaching this case in that way is probably the best way to do it in terms of trying to get the, the best answers. But at the end of the day, you know, I mean, I'm, my name is Paul Mannion, <laughs> um, and I am a Delphi murders a <laughs> uh, AKA Tober from Reddit. Like, pretty much, I'm known for creating the uh, Delphi Not Reddit sub initially, um, and then uh, I'm partially one of the creators for the Not Network Discord that is now defunct, and I am the creator of the now defunct but. Well, I'll put an asterisk on that uh, YouTube channel and Twitter account for the unraveling. Absolutely. Thank you so much for joining us. And 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 I wanted to ask you, have you always been interested in true crime? Is Delphi the first case that you really got invested in? Or has this been an interest for you for some time? So, like, I the, the first, like, real true crime case I kind of delved into was uh, the West Memphis Three. Um, but... How I came across Delphi, actually, 
many, many years later after that was me and my wife are both nurses. And throughout the pandemic, you know, we worked and we, you know, we come home and we'd want some form of entertainment, you know, so two things that we kind of started getting used to is watching some true crime, you know, uh, 48 hours, whatever, but then also Big Brother. And they kind of intertwined in a way that I, I found out about Delphi uh, because um, on the Canadian version of Big Brother, they, on their live feeds, I think it was the ninth season, uh, 2021. And I do believe it was the person who won, actually, ironically enough, um, Tyshawn. So they film in the winter and that year they started in March and they were kind of like getting to know each other and the house guests were all sitting around and they said, well, did anybody do anything exciting for Valentine's Day? And then they landed on this Tyshawn player and he says, you know, I was really thinking about Abby and Libby and everybody's like, who's Abby and Libby? And he's like, you know, and this is somebody in Canada. So it's kind of cool. You know, like it's like this like worldwide audience. And he explains the Delphi murders. And I said to my wife, I'm like, oh, you, did we ever hear about this, the, these murders that happened in Greece? And she's just like, and she looked on her phone. She's like, nope, this is like five hours away from us in Indiana. <laughs> so, um, you know, then I obviously went down the, uh, the whole rabbit hole, BG video sketches. And then I said, I said to her, I said, you know, I absolutely have to know. I, I know there's a Reddit sub. There has to be a Reddit sub on this because this is insane. And my wife always says, like, you know, that's that's when, uh, you know, Paul, like, lost his mind because he totally, like, went down the rabbit hole, like, fully um, at that point. And for context, this was kind of, like, around the time that Lee Kerr kind of appeared. <laughs> Ooh, you know, like, <laughs> everybody wants to know who Lee Kerr is, you know, so. Um, you want to explain the context around uh, Lee Kerr and what that whole situation is. I don't even know if we've ever really talked about that on the show in depth. <laughs> yeah, well, Lee Kerr is, like, a kind of mysterious figure that shows up. Uh, at the beginning of 2021 and, and has all these kind of crazy claims about the case that because you know I, I always say there were periods before Alan was arrested where there I mean it was like years where like there would be tumbleweeds that would just go by and nothing would happen so this Lee Kerr guy shows up and he's got all this like juicy information most of it turns out to be not true and it's probably just somebody like throwing crap at the wall and seeing what would stick it sounds like you know but um, at this point but um, one more thing that I'll just say about like the the my my Reddit handle is Tober and I it's it comes from the TV show Mr. Robot. I was not being very creative and I just you know Tober uh, underscore RM and it's it's Mr. Robot backwards. But I was a huge fan of the show Mr. Robot and other TV series and things like that. Uh, you know Lost, Dexter, Breaking Bad, that kind of thing. And one of the things that like I you know, would do when I would get into these TV series is I would try to find spoilers. I'm just one of those people that just like likes the spoilers. Like everybody hates me for it, but uh, it's, it's any, it's a good indication as any that, and, and a lot of people don't admit this, but I, I will admit this, that um, Delphi, it fills a void for me in terms of entertainment. Like it's something that I do that's entertaining. And I, I think some people could kind of interpret that as being disrespectful um, but I feel like it's kind of true about most people who follow the case, whether they admit it or not. But so the reason why I, I, I feel like I'm, I'm based enough to kind of come out and be like, this is just the reality of it. But it comes with the condition for me that to, to, to balance that, I at least have to make a commitment that whatever I do in this case, especially when I'm on social media and looking into it, that I make a real true commitment to getting to the bottom of the truth as best as I can. Not to say that I'm going to solve it or that like I have all the answers, but veering from, you know, not making that the number one priority, veering from that and, and putting other things in, in, in terms of like what I'm trying to do here is, is it's, it's sacrilegious. It is just something that I just would never, I would never do that, you know? So I just wanted to point that out because, uh, yeah, I. it's something that I'm really serious about. <clears throat> Absolutely. Uh, two things. First of all, mm -hmm. love to meet a fellow uh, lost, uh, yeah. lost watcher. Awesome. I gotta say, I used to have the uh, the Dharma initiative signs oh. on the bedroom <laughs> door. I was, yeah. Oh, I was wow. I, I, yeah, I printed it out for me and my sisters. I love that show. The other thing is, uh, you know, one thing that I think is really interesting and I wanted to just unpack before we go to our next question, um, you know, viewing the case like entertainment. 
but then also maintaining sort of a, a real interest in getting to the truth. Yes. I think by by being um, honest about that, uh, that they, people, some people view these cases and, as entertaining, but also maintaining that standard, mm -hmm. do you think that is a way for people to also continue to engage respectfully with the case? Yes, ex that's exactly what I'm trying to say. Because the reason why I, I point it out is because I think there's like a group of people out there that it's well-intentioned, but it's the, you know, people come out and they just say, you know, it's all about justice. And of course it is. My God, it is, is, is the justice is like the number one thing, but there can be a lot of driving, a lot of motivating factors as far as why people want to get to the bottom of it. But sometimes it gets convoluted when people bring in, because it's, it's like, there's so much to this case that it offers, but you always see people nonetheless bringing in like any other kind of reason they can to file the case. And it's, it's unbelievable. I, like I say, I admit right off the bat that this does, it, 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 it there's no question. Uh, um, it, it fills a void for me in that sense, but I, I, I absolutely 100% maintain that, like, I just, and I don't care how I look. If at the end of this, I look like a huge, you know, jackass, whatever, like, it's fine. Like, I just want to know what happened. That's pretty much it. That's kind of, you know, and, and I want, and I, in, in that sense, I want justice for the families because I think that's the closest semblance to justice that they're going to get is, is getting the best answers, you know? If you're a new parent, a bad day means you either ran out of coffee, diapers, patience, or all of the above. Stocking up on cold brew and deep breaths are all you. Hello Bellow's got your baby's butt covered. Because Hello Bello believes all families deserve premium, affordable baby products. With their ultra-convenient diaper bundle subscription service that includes seven packs of diapers and four packs of plant-based wipes, you'll never run out of supplies. Better yet, they're delivered to your door. Set, change, and cancel your delivery schedule whenever you want. If you're a parent, your to-do list is longer than all your baby's wake windows combined. Let Hello Bello take care of diaper runs until you're done potty draining. It was named Best Diaper Subscription by New York Magazine and winner of the 2022 Good Housekeeping Parenting Award for a reason. Go to hellobello.com slash Wondery to get 30% off your first customized bundle and a full-size freebie product of your choice. That's hellobello.com slash Wondery to start bundling with 30% off your first order. Don't forget, that's hellobello.com slash Wondery. Absolutely. No, I think I think it's I mean, honestly, I think they're in true crime there. There is a level of entertainment there and, and mm -hmm. finding that balance, but also being honest about this. This is right. entertainment, but we can still engage in it in a respectful and honest way. I think that's really important for people uh, to kind of consider that and where they're coming from with true crime. Uh, can you tell us how you began discussing the Delphi case online? and what the online culture around the case was like when uh, you started that process. Yeah, like, I, f I still feel like um, in, in 21 there, it was, you know, people were waking up every day. I always used to joke that people would, like, eat their, their, their Wheaties, and then they'd watch, like, the replay of, like, the 2019 presser or something like that from Doug Carter, because that was just what they, people had. You know, there wasn't a lot out there. So it was mostly theory-based. There was a lot of the, I don't know, I think at that time DP was the big the big thing. Um, everybody was obsessed with with that. Just like kind of almost like a niche kind of suspect that locals kind of were looking at, but never really panned out as far as I was aware. Um, and then yeah, the Lee Kerr thing. And then late 2021, you know, Keegan comes on and um, that whole thing. So that's kind of the environment that I kind of slid into. Yeah, and I think it's important to note it was very theory based and like mm -hmm. this is a time where not much was known so it kind of made sense for it to be people sharing ideas and saying Here's absolutely what might have happened yeah like the the real quick i'll just say like the impetus the reason why i even started um the the reddit sub for the delphi knot is because there was a problem I and mean, there still is a problem i think there will always be a problem with this but a lot of people like to start out their 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 posts on social media without kind of prefacing it with like, hey, this is just a theory, you know, it's just a problem people have, I don't know why, but, and then the line becomes blurred. So when this whole like DP thing was going on, a lot of those guys were getting in trouble on the subs because people were saying like, oh, you're saying this is fact and this is not, and it really wasn't. But so I said, you know, I'm gonna make a sub that you don't even have to say this is a theory. It's just assume that everything on here is a theory, but then go figure it's not the most popular sub because nobody wants to say that kind of stuff. They want, they want to imply that they have facts when, <laughs> It's it's mostly theory. That I guess that's just kind of how it goes. But and then how did you meet Courtney Parsons and Angela Sidlowski like within this community? So in 2022, uh, I pretty much summoned them from Reddit uh, because um, 
myself and Meerkat were sort of assembling like a, I don't know if you want to call it like a super sleuth group um, on Discord um, that pretty much, uh, you know, ended up becoming the Delphi Knot Discord. And then, um, well, then it became uh, the Knot Network, which is, we'll, call, we'll say that it's it's being paused for right now. That that makes that makes sense. And and what were, what were the your perceptions of those relationships um, at, at first? I guess. Um, you know, initially, it was innocent. I mean, like we 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 all wanted to know. We all wanted to know what was going on in the case. There wasn't a ton of information. We started to get better information, in in like the summer of twenty twenty two. There was. Some people had made some kind of more riskier moves, I guess, in trying to contact people closer to the case. I guess my biggest revelation in all that is, and I, and I hate to say this because I think people people have this idea that when the case is done, there's going to be like this big sign that pops out of the sky and it's like, you know, you've won or like, you know, like this person is the killer or whatever. And it's, <laughs> I think on some level, it's all theory. You know what I mean? Like it, it, it's just whose theory you're going to go with. It's It's people who have the case file, people who are closest to the case or, you know, lawyers or like experts, like everybody's, it, it just, everything is a theory at the end of the day, right? It's just some people's theories are more warranted than, than others, I guess. Uh, but that's what I kind of take from, from that era is that, yeah, uh, you're going to learn different people's theories along the way to, you know, doesn't really ma- mean if somebody is more credible or less credible, that their theory is also more credible or less credible. It, it, it everybody's got their own take on it, I guess, you know? Yeah, there's a lot of ambiguity, too, as as you said. It's like things are not always clear-cut in a case like this. Um, One one thing I was wondering is how did Barbara McDonald's theories in particular um, have an impact on this group early on? So so as as our information became a little bit better and, and I guess, higher quality, we kind of wanted to, to verify some of the information kind of get like an alternative perspective or whatever. One day I, I saw Barb chatting on Reddit. She just kind of appeared randomly. And just like Courtney and just like Angela, I, I said, Hey, come on over. And she was receptive and she was very gracious. She was, you know, but um, she shared her opinions in, in our discord and she didn't have to, you know, she could have probably elected not to or whatever, but she did. And it was kind of in sync with some of the things that we had heard. And that's what I'm saying. Like everything is sort of like a theory, you know, it, 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 some people have access to better information, obviously. Um, but, uh, you know, I guess people's theories are their, 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 their take on the case. And, uh, I guess you you take that into consideration. You, you have to consider that, I guess, when you incorporate theories into, how your what your understanding of the case is now i guess what i'm trying to say is in a roundabout way nobody has like better facts necessarily when they kind of convey their idea it's still going to have theory infused into it you know a little bit so yeah and it and that's so important to say because also you know you can be giving really good facts to everyone else and your interpretation could be flawed or it could just be you know influenced by your own biases Ex- but... that's Absolutely. Well said. Yep. That's exactly. Or or it could be spot on. I mean, um, I'm not even, you know, it it could be right. Uh, Right. So with McDonald, she was of the, her theory sort of centered Ron Logan. Is that Mm -hmm. right? Yeah. My, yeah, that's, I I would say Um, when we, when we, we brought her in and it was a very short amount of time. She wasn't in there for very long. She, uh, we expected her because at that time, um, the only thing that was kind of known about her takes on the case was that she interviewed Keegan, right? Like, so we, we, she came in and I just thought, okay, well, she's going to talk about Keegan, you know, and right away she immediately dismissed the Keegan thing. And she was like, no, it's not him and whatever. And she, you know, it's t- pretty much, um, she's kind of ambiguous in the way that she would kind of refer to like her theories. But then we had just recently heard about the Ron Logan theory from, another source uh you know what i i deem to be a pretty um credible source and the more and more she started kind of she did almost like an ama style discussion with with a group of us and the 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 more she started talking i guess i i kind of just said uh does your poi that you're kind of vaguely referring to by any chance is there any is it is it possible that they're not currently alive because you know ron had passed away earlier in the year 
and she immediately DM'd me and we started talking and she's just like, <laughs> right away, she was just very for forward and she was just like, you know, why do you think it's wrong? <laughs> and so I I said, you know, I, I, I don't know if it's wrong. I, I, I'm definitely leaning in that direction because of things that I've just heard and, and what, you know, so we had a pretty, uh, pretty robust discussion after that point about, and I, I, I'm not, like I said, I'm not blaming her for, for oh. that direction at all. I, it, it was something that I had heard before, um, I ever spoke to her, but she, but I definitely like was like, wow, you know, like she's a journalist and she, she has to look into things and she verifies things. So, um, and I, and I think she still to this day believes that, that Ron Logan, um, could very well be, um, you know, somebody who's implicated in the crime in some way. Uh, can you tell us how the YouTube channel, The Unraveling, came to be? And maybe explain who the owner of that channel is. Yeah, so, um, like, after we kind of got things... Uh, so, the Discord channel um, in 2022, as we started kind of recruiting people, kind of uh, took form and evolved from a couple iterations, and then it ended up becoming The Not Network. We had always kind of, like thrown around the idea of starting a YouTube channel and, but we never really enacted the, those, um, acted on those plans. Uh, and then in the spring of 23, the images of Rick Allen started to come out with, from the defense team where he was like, you know, emaciated and disheveled. Uh, and it, it, it incensed us. Like it, it kind of lit a fire under us. And we were like, you know, we kind of felt in a way that we had a mandate to maybe take to, uh, social media and and so then i i said hey let's you know what about that youtube channel that we were thinking about and it, it was still kind of just talk right so like there was like little salient aspects that we couldn't even agree on like it took us almost like a month just to come up with the name but still nobody's doing anything so one day i well immediately after we got the name i i, I got super serious about it i made a title screen I came up with the intro, graphics, music, and then, you know, I created a Gmail account that was connected to all of the socials, you know, the YouTube, Twitter, uh, Facebook, TikTok. So I, I created that. That That's, you know, in perpetuity and in every other sense of the word, I am the owner of the unraveling. But yeah, it's important, though, um, that I always say, like, even though the impetus of the unraveling was absolutely... Our, our, our perceived uh, mistreatment of Rick Allen, uh, it was it's always it was always going to be within the context of a true crime channel. But and I've said this on the channel before, too, is our mission statement uh, is quite simply that when the, the book is effectively closed, so to speak, on the Delphi murders, that it's like no no stone is left unturned like it's like everybody has as many questions as they can answer that's the only thing that we wanted to do and that was we agreed we all agreed upon that initially and there's there's no negotiating that that was the mission statement um and and yeah like i said everybody was in agreement with with that as far as i was to understand that makes sense and it kind of goes back to what you were saying about a core value for you is in this, you know, in, in true crime in general, is that search for the truth and, and answers. Exactly. I wanted to ask you, you know, one thing that I know we've talked about just, you know, in, in prior conversations, mm -hmm. I, I thought this was really interesting. Um, just can you tell us more about your idea about the importance of, of having sort of boundaries with a true crime case and sort of what that separation can look like for you and why you think that, um, you know, could be important. And that, that kind of ties into with my acknowledgement that it's entertainment for me, but it's real life for some people. And it's not really fair for me to, uh, I guess in, in Hollywood terms, even when they say breaking down the fourth wall uh, mm -hmm. to like, I, I, I do make an honest effort to not do that if I can. Uh, maybe Barb is the closest thing. Some Most people do not share that philosophy. Uh, it, it, and, and sometimes it, it's fine it, that that's okay that people don't but like for instance i've had opportunities to um you know through uh third parties to you know talk to people like becky patty um or you know even jerry holman uh other people like that now if those people reach out to me or something like that for whatever reason that's fine but i am not going to do that partially because i don't think it's right but also it's just 
I want to just separate those things, even for my view, viewing of the case and, and, and how I kind of approach the case. It just, it's better for me to do it that way. But yeah, there's, it's just, it just makes more sense for me to do that. And yeah, set a boundary that I, I know is, is right for me at least. Yeah, no, I mean, I, I, obviously we don't do that. Um, no, yeah. And I, and I, but, I, no, I, but I'll, I'll tell you, I think it actually makes sense for some people to do it that way. I think there's different kind of ways you can approach true crime. And I think what you're saying is kind of, makes sense from the perspective of i feel like you are kind of the classic internet sleuth where you're trying mm -hmm. to get at like okay what are some ideas how can we bounce this around kind of to try to get at the truth right. and in that setting it kind of makes sense to keep some separation yes um if you're taking a more journalistic approach it can be different if you're taking yeah. an opinion based approach it can be different right no and i understand like when, when when you're really trying to be like the you know get to the journalist part of it i totally understand why somebody would be like no i got to reach out and talk to this person no i i'm not i'm not being i'm critical of i'm, no, I'm saying I, for I me don't think you are i think yeah. I, i'm just saying i think i think it makes sense and i think i think one thing and listen i think i've been guilty of this too you know we tend to talk about true crime as if it's a monolith but it's not it's actually p different approaches can work and we should talk about like what what those different avenues can sure. work like. yeah especially like when I guess in this case, when it's it, I mean, I know like Doug Carter gets upset when people say like, you know, a cold case or whatever at that time. But when there's so many years that have gone by and they don't have answers, yeah, it's like you got to get, you got to think about it in a lot of different contexts and ways to kind of get to an answer. I mean, so, yeah. I'm curious, what sort of things got out about the witness, uh, Betsy Blair, prior to the release of the Franks memorandum? So allegedly it was, it was, told to us well allegedly it was told to courtney or maybe angela whichever one from matt hoffman that one of the witnesses uh, just, for, uh, just a second who is matt hoffman matt hoffman is i guess i don't know what his official title is i know that he is a pi that works for um andrew baldwin i don't know if he's like the lead pi uh i don't know if that's a, a thing but he's a, a a pi for andrew baldwin um you know, he just had kind of mentioned that this, you know, after that information dump happened in June of 23, where people learned people's names, uh, he says, oh, yeah, you know, like that Betsy Blair, she's refuting what's in the PCA. So and that that's all I mean, again, and that's alleged. That's an alleged thing that I'm, I don't I I can't vouch for that myself, but it's what was relayed to me. And then obviously you saw in the Frank's memo about a month or two after we had been told that, or that the girls had been told that uh, it did come to fruition, at least in, in terms of fi filings. Um, so, so it's interesting, like there's kind of this contact with Hoffman and I'm, I'm curious, was there an associated sort of shift in culture, rhetoric discussions around both the knot as well as um, the unraveling? So, what I, what I would say is in our discord for a very long time, when we would talk about things, people kind of didn't know how to take it, like as far as some of the things that we'd claim. And I think once the Frank's memo came out, some of the things that we had kind of talked about in private or whatever to groups of people, it was like, oh, my God, like these guys do actually talk to some people. And it, it, it there was there was absolutely a dynamic shift. Uh, people were just a lot more uh i don't know there wasn't any there wasn't a whole lot of pushback on anything we ever did like as far as um skepticism uh yeah it, it just i guess it seemed that we were validated in a way in some of the things that we had been saying um at least t to their understanding of it because for for a long time if, if you're gonna you know like you have uh some of these discussions about like Ron Logan or things that like it, hard, things that are harder to prove or at least things that people aren't going to come out. Like, for example, uh, like like Barb McDonald, when she's on court TV and things like that, or when she's in, in mainstream media, she doesn't really opine about a, like the case a lot. It's just covering the basic facts. So when we start saying, oh, like, you know, Barb said this, Barb said that. No, she didn't. I saw her on court TV last week and she's, you know, she's talking about Keegan or, or whatever, you know, um, uh, but th in this instance, you have these high profile lawyers echoing what we said months prior. So it kind of gave us a little bit more credibility, I guess you could say. And, and people were just uh, there was absolutely dynamic shift, I feel. Makes sense. Um, and one thing I was just wondering, just to lock this down before we ask more questions around this is so mm -hmm. 
there was contact with, um, can you tell us about the kind of level of contact at this point with Hoffman and sort of what that entailed and what that looked like? All I can say is what I've been told, um, like through, um, I, I've never spoken to Matt Hoffman directly. So everything regarding Hoffman is, is an asterisk with allegedly, uh, but I do know that at some point, and I don't know how the contact was established or whatever, uh, it was mainly Angela who did start talking to him. And yeah, that's, you know, every once in a while I would, she would kind of share information with myself and Courtney. And sometimes we'd share it with the larger group and, and, and the veracity of it, the, any of those items I can't speak to. Mm-hmm. I just know what I was told, you know, at that, at that time. And to be clear, anything that I say here, um, I'm not doing it. I'm not coming out and saying this stuff to, to be like, Oh, I'm going to get you in trouble. It's not about that. It, it's more about my suspicions around the, motivations behind doing so i'm i i have a very controversial take on information being shared it's not what most people how most people feel as far as uh you know like this gag order and all that kind of stuff but if it's under the guise of we are being we are in a situation that's very oppressive we can't talk about things we can't get our message out we need the help of content creators and youtubers that's one thing but if it's something else to manipulate a narrative or something like that, which it sort of feels like that in some instances, I'm not going to be a part of that. Like I'm not going to be used in that way. Uh, and, and that's how it feels in, in, in some, some cases. So and that's, be, yeah. So like there's a level of concern, just to make sure I understand that there's a level of concern from you that essentially like people everyday people who don't have a legal background may be being manipulated to a certain extent to spread a message rather than you know more more so than anything else is is that fair to say is that kind of where you your, your concerns are yeah that's that's how it feels it some things just don't add up and you know even in the event that maybe some of the information is correct and i'm wrong which I guess certainly is in the realm of possibility. I don't think it's very likely, but if I am wrong on that, I still think that there needs to be some consideration for the ramifications, I guess, that have occurred because of that and some of the destructive behaviors of people. Maybe they weren't predictable, but at least at this point they should stop because people, for whatever reason, if there's like a viral quality to the way that some of these people are reacting to this, that it's like overtaking their lives and it's, it's causing destruction in their lives. And I, I, I'm seeing it, you know, uh, to these, some of these people and it's, it's irresponsible, um, to do this, especially if it's not, uh, embedded in, in truth to, to the knowledge of, of these guys, or at least to, to, to Matt Hoffman. Uh, what did the defense claim about their, uh, experience with the pathologist lab? Something occurred in February, which um, maybe we'll, we'll talk about that. But I sort of was told something that kind of made me reevaluate a bunch of stuff. And one of the first things I went back to was the fact that at the end of su- last summer, it was kind of suggested by Matt Hoffman that allegedly, again, that the you know, as you see, like in some of the discovery or in some of the motions that are filed, they are not getting things that they feel like they should be getting in the discovery. So it was said that they didn't have the autopsy report. And it was kind of odd because that's kind of late in the game to not be having the autopsy report. So they kind of suggested that they they had to reach out to this lab to get a copy of that. And they, they said that the lab assistant there was kind of giving them the runaround. And then the part that kind of annoyed me, like, so when I said, like, I learned this, this thing in, in February and I came back to look at when the Frank's memo came out, I've never believed the Odinism stuff, but I thought that at least the components that were in it were, you know, true. But Courtney was actually the first one to kind of point out that like in the fine print, when you look at it, they do make it a point to say that their description of the crime scene in in that memo is entirely based on like pictorial analysis of the crime scene photos and she's like you know where's mention of the autopsy report and so then they once again went back and asked hoff like well how come you guys didn't use the autopsy report 
And his alleged um, explanation at that point was like, well, you know, we did finally get a copy of that, but we just, we don't believe it's it's very accurate. And to me, that's problematic because, so if you're gonna, if you're gonna make this memo and you're gonna explain these things and you wanna do it in a balanced way, why not say, okay, this is what we see, but just so you know, this is what the autopsy report shows you decide. You know what I mean? As opposed, and it's, it's, it's just kind of a sneaky, it's a, it's cheap. It's a cheap trick. Like, uh, let people decide. And, you know, is it because what the actual autopsy shows is makes a lot more sense than somebody, uh, fleeing from the crime scene with like a Mountain Dew jug full of, of blood or whatever they're, they're trying to say. I mean, that's ridiculous. So yeah, I don't buy it, but, but th those are one of the things that I went back and I kind of reevaluated and it made me kind of think twice like what's going on here man but were there other um sort of red flags so to speak with the frank's memorandum that sort of raised your hackles a bit when you read it when you read the the theory of uh the defense's theory of the crime um that was the big one what made you not love the odinism theory in just in general well there was there was an exchange in February that really kind of made me know that I my suspicions were right. But just in general, uh, even before like when I first read that first line, I was just like uh, the biggest eye roll you can imagine. Like you could hear it, you know. It's like so like uh, the thing is, as I pointed out before, that and it is true. Year after year, the sleuthing community does they do get it wrong in Delphi. However, that's I don't believe that that is the only takeaway. I think that they can still learn things uh, along the way. And to me, Brad Holder is just, he's just the usual suspect. If it would have been as simple as somebody like Brad Holder having done this, it's not even just about like this potential investigation that went awry or whatever. There would be other quote unquote tentacles since everybody likes to use that phrase in this, in this case that would kind of crop out from somebody like Brad Holder being the killer, I believe. Um, and, and again, there's people who have, because he is that kind of, he has that kind of presence. There are people who have like loads and loads of information and data on him. And I just feel like everybody would have known by now if it was him. I, that's just my, but yeah. Um, yeah. That's, that, that's kind of my, my feel, uh, my initial, that was my initial take on it. And I even said that on the channel, I, you know, I, I, I kind of said, I'm going to put the Odinism stuff aside, but I at least thought that the claims were based in, in the defense team's own beliefs uh, that, that it could be Odinism. You referred a couple of times to something that happened in February. So, so yeah. <laughs> yeah. So in, in February, um, I had a conversation, um, a text message exchange uh, with Courtney and she pretty much, I don't know. It's like, I don't know if you've ever had a conversation with somebody when like they tell you something and they almost don't understand like the magnitude or the significance of it entirely somehow. Uh, so what she, we were discussing, cause I, I wanted to do a Ron Logan episode. It's something that I want to do for a really long time. I think after the defense team, cause we, we were planning on doing one in the fall. And then when the defense team dropped the Frank's memo, because we really, despite some of the things that were being shared, allegedly, we had no idea that they were going in, in this Odinism direction at all. It was a to we were totally taken. Uh, and, it, and it's odd because some other creators did know. But I think even like Rick Snay kind of mentioned it on his on one of his lives before the Frank's memo. So there was a time when we were going to do this, this Ron Logan episode. Then once this came out, it was like, nah, we're going to hold on to that. I'm like, come on. You know, everybody knows that we like really we believe that it's Ron. Like, let's do this episode. So I went ahead and did my own uh, in, in February and the girls didn't want anything to do with it. But kind of in the in the talks about how I was going to, uh, you know, approach that episode, it was just kind of casually stated to me that um, Hoffman allegedly told Courtney, he said, quote, there's two paths here. One of them solves the crime and then the other one frees Rick. And it was just said no not a ton of thought given to uh you know to it beyond that and i just thought what does that mean like i mean 
come on, like, you know, but again, it was in the context of Ron and, and if he was a potential, you know, suspect or whatever to, to, to them. But, you know, I would eventually, it, it bothered me to the point where I eventually came back to that comment and I confronted them about it. And it's like, I told them, I said, you know, maybe a month or two later, that conversation is like, when it comes, comes to you two, that's like when the music died because for me, because I, I really, I couldn't get past that. Like, I just couldn't, that's not something that I can negotiate. They, they claim that it was that, no, that's not the way that it was said or whatever. But I mean, it's pretty clear if, if that's what he said, that, <laughs> I mean, it's an acknowledgement to me that, that they know that this Odinism thing is nonsense. So what are we doing here? You know, <laughs> that's ridiculous. Right. And yeah, I mean, it's, it's a, often a risk to do a third party suspect in the first place. So, right. And I imagine from you, your perspective as someone who wants to get at the truth, that's especially frustrating. Absolutely. Yeah. And yeah. I tried to, I tried to voice my opinion about it and you know, it was just, well, you know, you're not a team player anymore. That's kind of how that was going on behind the scenes since, since like early February. Is, is that, was that a shift going from a place where you could almost talk about any theory and kind of discuss the merits to a place where perhaps that was yeah. more reflected? It, it's almost more that than it is even just, because it would have been different if everybody would have, everybody's suspicions would have been erased and I could be like, okay, but I was like the odd man out, you know, I was like, what are you talking about? Like, there's this, there's this presumption and I, I see this on, on, on the, the, the prosecution maximalist side as well, that everybody kind of assumes that there's all this information that somebody has that they're basing this on. So like when something doesn't add up, it's like, well, wait, you don't know, you know, but like with the defense maximalists now it's, it's the, it's the exact same thing. Well, they're saying these things, but you don't know why they're saying it. They, they they have all the discovery. There might be a good reason why. And it's like, okay, show me the money then where, like, I, 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 I feel like we'd have already seen something that that indicates Holder. And, and and the fact of the matter is, is you know, I'm I'm not a lawyer. You know, the everybody prefaces a, you know that's the the big thing to preface that too because it's true. But I also think that even just the insinuation that Brad Holder's alibi isn't is somehow weak. I mean, it's it's the standard alibi. He was punched in to, at work. Like, what are you talking about? Like, I don't even understand that. Like, I, I don't know. It's frustrating. <laughs> Yeah, and and I mean, what you're saying is so true. I mean, I remember for years it would drive me um, crazy when uh, you have people being, you know, saying things like, "Well, you know, Doug Carter must have phrased this in this way because he's playing some 5D chess." And <laughs> the and QAnon he, stuff, yeah. Like it's like no, like like, <laughs> like people, I know people when they when they want a side to be correct, they imbue that side with all sorts of amazing absolutely and like thoughtfulness, and it's like. Let's just assume everyone involved is a human being who's probably trying their best. Right. <laughs> Absolutely, yeah. <laughs> Sorry, it, it, it it it's it's laughable for sure. I I I agree. It's no, but what you're saying is like so true, and it definitely resonates. Um, mm -hmm. I wanted to ask, um, just to go more into this, with, with um, with with the kind of shift, just. What, what were the connections? We talked a little bit about Matt Hoffman, but also the previous investigator, Jason Jensen. Um, what were the connections they had to the sort of online Delphi community, as far as you understand? So I, I don't have any working knowledge of, of the actual, how that works. I don't even really know how high up, supposedly, Matt Hoffman really is. It, it's It was conveyed to me that he allegedly is their top PI. And there are certainly reasons to believe that, because like I said, like some of the filings, information that he would share would would be part of the filings. I mean, that's in a way sort of, I mean, at least if you're, you know, there is reason to believe that that is true. But I don't know. Jason Jensen was briefly mentioned early on uh, as having a specific role of some sort in terms of his PI work. And then he was not used after that. That was my understanding. But I don't know anything beyond that. And I don't know the dynamic between PIs and how, how they did that. I, I'm not even sure. Um, can you tell us about the event that was called um, Groundswell? <clears throat> yeah, so like, uh, ironically, or maybe not so much, uh, I, I didn't know anything about Groundswell uh, as it was occurring. It was very, 
it was just this buzzword that started popping up everywhere. And, and it was odd because like in September of last year, myself and Angela went to Delphi or went to Indiana to film for the CW uh, documentary. And I know that after we had left, there was kind of like a, from, from Angela anyways, there was just this sort of, all right, I've, I've got my fill from, from Indiana. I don't need to go back there. Cause that was the first time she had ever been there. And so it was a shock to me that once November came around, she just kind of willy nilly was like, Oh, going right back. So I was just kind of, wait a minute, what's going on? That's, that's odd. But yeah, it was, I guess it was a, I don't know, it was the Supreme court was going to make a decision here on, on, on the writ or whatever. I, I believe that was like the, the event that happened at Groundswell F. I'm not mistaken. I don't, maybe you guys know better, but Angela kind of touted herself as a community organizer, that kind of thing. Um, and she had kind of said that she had done it before. So I was just kind of questioning the very short amount of time that they kind of threw it together. And I don't feel like people had enough time to even plan to go to that. So, you know, and I told them when they did it, like, I, I actually do think that they're, um, that Courtney and Angela are very brave for, for going out there. I, I would have my own reservations of doing it myself, but the optics of it, when you see like, there's like, you can't even go into double digits hardly of the people who showed up for it. It doesn't look good, you know? So, but yeah, I, I couldn't go anyways because I was in Puerto Rico, like at the end of last summer. And then right when I came back, uh, I went to go to Indiana for the, to film for that CW. And then it just, I wasn't going to make it back to, to Indiana any, at, at anyways, um, for, for that event. But yeah, it was, it was kind of odd to me that it kind of went down like that. Right. You think you'd want more lead time planning it. Um, yeah. Just Even other people like just so people can. Yeah. I mean, I think that, sh that they did it in a, like a matter of weeks. Like it was only like two or three weeks that people had to plan. And it's, I don't know. I also tend to think that locally there's, there's just like a different feeling versus like worldwide. I do think people in Indiana um, tend to in that area sort of tend to believe that, um, that Rick Allen is more likely to be uh, guilty. Uh, and I think worldwide people are a little bit more open to maybe other ways of looking at things or however you want to say it. But, you know, again, you give people more time, you might have at least a better appearing out outcome, I guess. Uh, it just, it, again, there just wasn't, it didn't look impressive on, on camera for, for, for what they were trying to achieve uh, for, for support for Alan. Right. You bring up a really interesting point about sort of the local scene in Indiana versus sort of the internet. And I think that's, an, that's mm -hmm. a dynamic that we've seen play out. I will say that in our experience, just living here, I think people were pretty split about guilt or innocence until relatively recently. Um, I think the thing that people had a harder time believing locally was the idea of a large scale conspiracy mm -hmm. operating here. I think a lot of the assumptions about Carroll County being like the most corrupt place on earth. I think people kind of, you know, when you live, when you live in a place, you're like, uh, I don't really see that whether, you know, I mean, I think it's easier when you're on the outside to be like, mm -hmm. everyone's in on it, you know? Um, right. But, but definitely it's interesting to shift, um, locally with guilt or innocence. Mm -hmm. uh, I want to I ask what, one thing with groundswell, um, you know, did Courtney and Angela talk about, you know, meeting anyone associated with the case as far as that went? So allegedly, yeah, they had kind of, yeah, they, they indicated that at some point, I don't know, I, I think it was either, it might've been before or after the actual date that they had met with Matt Hoffman, how that occurred. I'm not entirely sure. Um, if they met him at Walmart or at, at, at you know, their hotel, something along those lines, they, they, they met him. Yeah. And what did they tell you about what happened at that meeting? They, they at least discussed the case in a lot more detail than most people, uh, have knowledge of in the public. Uh, and yeah, it's whether they were, it was just talked about or they were shown anything i'm not sure but uh 
at some point they their knowledge and their understanding of the case kind of uh, exceeded pretty significantly like what it was prior to that um or at least that's the impression that they were given you know i, I don't know i i can't say for sure what they they shared after that is is legitimate but uh i i don't know um it, obviously we weren't there you weren't there mm -hmm. um, the only people who were there were courtney angela and allegedly uh matt hoffman uh did they claim that he showed them anything i mean i don't it, it's hard to say because they didn't really talk about it in that way they just kind of mentioned what they kind of knew after that point so i would I think it'd be hard for him not to have but i don't know if it was done in a way that was like oh here's this here's this here's this i don't think it was that i think it was just kind of like you know at any rate you need to know this you need to know that and he, yeah he did kind of indicate that uh cuz you have to you have to understand at this time they're off the case right like they 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 the defense team is is not on the case and this and again this is all allegedly but uh they had said that they were concerned that something could potentially happen to them and that in the event that they're not allowed back on the case or even something worse happens that somebody really needed to kind of like you know bear the torture you know have you know take the information so that it was in the hands of somebody who could maybe do something with it one day right so that was sort of um so allegedly sort of what matt mm -hmm. hoffman is saying is like us on the defense team we're 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 scared that the odinists will come after us mm -hmm. yeah yeah i and that was that was a part of it as well that that i i was understanding it i don't know it <laughs> it's weird because i'm so skeptical of the odinist thing but i mean i can even imagine a scenario where just because they're insisting on going in this direction that maybe they did make some Odinists angry with them. I don't know. I don't know. Or it, it, it could just be something that, you know, I, I always think of, uh, when I think of that claim from him, I can't help but think of, there's a movie called True Lies with Arnold Schwarzenegger. I don't know if you, you guys are familiar with it, where there's this, there's a, <laughs> there's a, he, so Jamie Lee Curtis is, is married to Arnold Schwarzenegger and there's a guy that she works with who's claiming to be like this like CIA operative. And it turns out he's just like a, you know, a fake or whatever, but he's kind of trying to make it sound like all impressive and whatever. And <laughs> I don't know. I just imagine Hoffman trying to make it sound like he's like in like all this grave danger to sound cool or something. I don't know. I don't really know the, the, how, how the transaction or, you know, the, the information was shared. It's just, uh, yeah, it's just what I've been told. Some of these things. It, it seems very over the top of yeah. a claim. Mm -hmm. And so did did um, Angela or Courtney ever share messages that purported to be from Hoffman uh, with you? Yes, um, I do know, um, just as a matter of fact, that they they were in contact. I mean, I guess I should still put allegedly in front of it because, I mean, I guess in a crazy scenario, they could have fabricated that. But I don't think they did. I, I do believe that they really were in, in contact with each other. Um, I will say that some of the more shocking claims that I had heard uh, were not in text format. Not proof. I guess I don't have proof of them. It's, it was just more casual conversations of the things that I had seen. Um, but yeah, makes sense. Um, and and one thing I was what like, sort of shocking claims are you referring to? And the people who are curious, um, you don't ask. That's fair. Yeah. The the most what struck me the most out of all the things that um, they had shared with me is that allegedly. They claim that when they did finally get either the data or actually, I don't know, I don't know how it would have happened in, in discovery if it's if it's in what in what format, but they they were able to glean from some kind of information that when you look at the girl, when you look at Libby's phone, there and you look at the metadata for the infamous bridge guy video, that you can see the time is in accordance with what the narrative has always been. The date is in accordance with what has always been. And the footage itself, when you look at it, is in fact the girls and then the the, the portion where Bridge Guy appears. But they claim then that the GPS location does not align with the Monon High Bridge. And you can you can start to do all the you know the calculations and in, in the, the the gymnastics in your head about how how that could be 
it's very confusing if that's true or not. Again, maybe it's true, but if I had to guess, there's probably some kind of a rational explanation uh, that uh, I'd be just speculating, but I mean, it's an odd thing if it's true. I'm curious, you know, did Angela and Courtney mention anything about meeting with uh, Baldwin and Rosie around this time? Uh, or any time. Or any time. They never have. Angela was always adamant that she had never met them. Um, but I do know that when she was initially subpoenaed for the contempt hearing, her and Courtney, well, she had done at least Zooms with with, um, with Baldwin, but I, I'm... I think that was just kind of in accordance with the fact that they were going to be taking the stand. I think it'd be very similar to like what, uh, you know, you've heard about maybe, I don't know. I, I don't know who was kind of reporting on it saying that like, uh, like Julie Melvin and Skip Jansen were, were talking with the defense team kind of prep getting prepped for things that they would have. It, it's something along those lines. If there's anything beyond that, I'm not aware of it. I've never, they've never shared that with me. And I, I, I feel like they would, but I, I don't know. Makes sense. Yeah, it's, it's standard. Um, mm -hmm. Meet with witnesses. Uh, I'm, another thing I wanted to ask you, did Hoffman ever express concerns that the state was corrupt and going to essentially frame Allen? The, my only like hesitation on answering that is I'm not sure if that was like a paraphrase from Angela or I had actually seen a text conversation where he says something along those lines. Um, I think Again, I'll, I'll put this under the allegedly column. Everything is, obviously. But I want to say that he had said something along the lines of indicating that the case against Allen is, like, so incredibly weak that they are actually concerned that the only way that they're going to be able to um, convict him is if they fabricate some kind of evidence, I, I think. And again, I don't know if that was... Angela just saying that or if that was actually from Hoffman but it was certainly indicated that Hoffman had said this uh I'm just trying to remember if I if I actually saw a, a conversation to kind of support that or if it was just a claim that Angela made I, I don't remember now that, that, that makes sense and we appreciate you kind of yeah yeah about that and you know in a way of like what what you've seen and what you've almost been told um I'm I'm curious, you know, there was a time, you know, regarding the leak um, where an email that we sent to the defense team ended up circulating. Can you tell us about that time? Yeah. So um, when Courtney and Angela were leaving Groundswell, I believe in, in uh, Angela's case, she was actually on the plane when I got this text. But I got in a text and Angela was a little bit annoyed Courtney was absolutely irate with me. Like she, I don't, she almost like didn't talk to me for like a week or two after this happened, but they said that, um, Andrew Baldwin had just gotten a really threatening letter from the murder sheet. And in the body of this email, um, it was a screenshot of the discord and a comment that I had made. We will see other references in the episodes we released today about this allegedly threatening email we sent to Andrew Baldwin in late November, 2023. Whenever this comes up, we are going to try to make it very clear that this email was not in the least bit threatening. It was, in fact, a simple request for comment. On a public Discord, Paul had written a message indicating that attempts had been made to warn the defense team about a possible leak well before the disastrous leak of crime scene photos. Paul indicated that the defense team had not seemed terribly interested in this warning. We did not want to run this information on our program without first contacting Andrew Baldwin and asking if it was true. Our email was an attempt to be fair to him. It was not a threat. Any suggestion otherwise is false. If it becomes necessary, we will release the relevant email so everyone can see that they do indeed support our version of events. Paul shared with us the story of how Angela Sidlowski did indeed discover a possible leak on the defense side well before the crime scene photo leak. In our discussion, we used the real name of the person we have referred to as R. R is the man who received crime scene photos from Mitch Westerman, who is a close friend of defense attorney Andrew Baldwin. As the photos began to circulate more widely, R committed suicide. We wish to respect the privacy of his family, and so we have declined to use his name. Because of that, we will paraphrase this portion of our talk with Paul. R was active on a Reddit group to discuss the Delphi murders. Many people on this group, 
including R, posted under names that were obviously not their real identities. For some reason, R became convinced that one of these posters, a person who went by the name Helix Harbinger, was in fact Slodowski. At the same time, it was also clear to people in that Reddit group that R seemed to have special information about the case that was not widely known. Concerned about all of this, Sedlowski reached out to Matt Hoffman, an investigator for the defense team. Hoffman indicated that he did not know who R was and speculated that his special information may have indicated that R had a connection to someone who was recently deposed in the case. No further action appears to have been taken from there. We saw this anecdote as a sign that the defense received an early warning about a leak and could perhaps have acted to stop it before the crime scene photos were circulated. Let's now rejoin Paul as he discusses why he shared the anecdote. We will remove any further mention of R's name. But my whole point in that was, when I just said that was, you know, and this was months later, I just said something along the lines of, you know, they didn't, the defense team really sincerely did not know who and was at that point, or at least Hoffman didn't because Angela asked him and he didn't, he genuinely didn't know. And I remember that because that conversation happened when I was on the highway in in, in Indiana uh, from the CW. It was around that time, like mid-September because of that Reddit exchange, he, uh, the girls looked into him just to, to be sure, like, who is this guy? But for all I know, after Hoffman was aware of who he was, I don't know that he did anything with that at all. He might've just been like, yeah, whatever, who is this guy? Who knows, you know, whatever. And then just moved on. But yeah, they were pretty upset. Cause they're like, you know, you, you need to be careful about what you say in the discord and things like that, because you know, you're going to get these guys in trouble or whatever. And yeah, that was, I kind of got, you know, reprimanded for that a little bit. So, sorry. <laughs> oh, um, no, I, 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 it's not even that I, that's not the point. I'm just saying, um, that was just, uh, yeah. It, and, and I don't know, I don't know if I can't even say for sure that, well, I mean, Baldwin had to have known because, but it could have just been a conversation between Baldwin and, and Hoffman. I don't really know that Baldwin ever was aware that Angela was contacted. You know what I mean? Like, I don't know enough about that, that, dynamic i'm not sure i mean baldwin has to know who angela is now if, if he's had a zoom meeting with her apparently but like i don't know that he's aware of the full extent that she knows what she knows you know what i mean no i think that's important to state you know it's 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 a le- it's possibly a, a connection through matt hoffman and Noah. yeah i'm curious there's also a story out there involving a, a laptop belonging to some youtuber that i think we're not going to name uh, can you tell us that anecdote? Yeah, so it was a, maybe late April or mid-April or something like that. Uh, I know it was just shortly before the previous um, trial date that everybody was kind of like, you know, waiting for or anticipating. I had learned that uh, Matt Hoffman had gone to the home of a YouTuber to retrieve a hard drive that belonged to another YouTuber for what I don't know. But as far as I think it has something to do with a theory that Michael Osbrook had that the YouTuber may have been involved in the crime somehow. But the significance to me is, and it's, it was a red flag to me as well, because, uh, you know, it's, it's literally weeks before this trial, and this is how you guys are choosing to to spend your time to look into this silly theory that uh, this YouTuber had something to do with the, the crime. Um, but also it was, again, this from from the defense maximalist side or everybody's discussing this in, in private circles. It was there was no concern. It wasn't like a concern, like, should they really be doing this? Everybody was like almost cheering it on, like what's wrong with you guys? Like, this is bad. This is not good. This is the, the, the fact that they're, they're wasting their time on this tells me that it's just, it's a, it's a, another indication that they're, they're just, I don't know. To me, it, it just seems like they're screwing around. They're not taking stuff seriously, but then, you know, a couple weeks later they go into this, this, uh, pretrial meeting and they're like, Oh, we're not ready and all this stuff. And I don't know for me, I, I I'm an action person over words and, you know, actions just kind of speak more so to uh, intent and the fact that they weren't ready to go when previously we had been told, oh, they, they're they ready to go next week if need be. What happened? You know, what happened to that? So uh, I don't know. Kind of lost faith in, 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 
and this idea that they have this like very very strong case for Rick. I wanted to ask, um, you know, you kind of describing feeling uncomfortable with some of the rhetoric and, and losing faith in the defense team to that extent. Um, when did it get to the point where you uh, were starting thinking like <laughs> I need to remove myself from from this space because um, it's just it's uh, too toxic. It, you know, it's it's really uh, it was that exchange with Courtney. It just kind of weighed on me, uh, where she just kind of it, it it wasn't even so much the inf- it was the information, but it was also just the lack of awareness that that her and Angela both had, and the implication that that they were that they were more like vested in a particular outcome than you know knowing the truth or getting the truth for everybody who's interested, especially the families and things like that, you know, that's the only reason why, again, and that's why I, 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 I try to hammer that home. Uh, it's what I try to do. You know, I, I don't have, you know, I, I've watched this in, in the true crime community. I've seen people over the course of, of eight years now, people have used this case to try and get laid. People have tried to, you know, make money. Uh, people have tried to do, you know, whatever you want to do, you know, network, uh, do all these things. And I don't, I, I think those are all fine if those things happen, but they shouldn't be your number one priority. So just, just these, I don't do that. I, I feel like there, it should be very clear cut why, why people are doing what they're doing. Um, and, and nothing else should be, should matter. So when something like that is, is kind of bold faced, just stated, and then it's like, oh yeah, business as usual. It's like, that's weird. That's weird. I can't do that anymore. You know, really commend you for that. And, and thank you so much for saying that, because I think that people need to understand that people do use this case for any number of things or even just getting attention. Like that sounds so. It's astounding. It is crazy. Yeah, it's astounding. And, it, and it's, it's, um, as you said, it's, it's okay to, you know, for those things to happen as a byproduct of doing good work or doing right. Work, uh, but like, it, that shouldn't be the, sole goal right. of, of a project Jeez. you're preaching yeah to <laughs> no exactly yeah um i wanted to ask you um if you could talk us through your decision to sort of uh, at least for the time being end the unraveling yeah so um basically um there, there's a lot of ways that i could answer this and there's not just one reason the easiest way for me to explain this there, there's there's very specific reasons that i have but in general, the best way to explain it is that it's it's like how I say it. it's one thing to be accused of being the supporter of a child murder, and it's another thing to actually be one. I feel that if you don't, if you're not scrutinizing information and things like that, you're not doing a good job of making sure that again that the the difference there is is more on the side of of just being accused. So once I started voicing some concerns and uh, I wanted to kind of ex- explore or examine alternative things that maybe just didn't align with Alan being innocent, I got a little bit of pushback and my, you know, I started to diverge with the girls as that ac- kept occurring. You know, you have this problem where I think they look at it as an arithmetic problem where it's, you know, two versus one. But at the end of the day, you know, like, again, if if I believed that wholeheartedly, like I I did at one point that Alan was innocent, I'm okay being wrong at the end of the day. That's different. But when there's reason to kind of question that and it's just not going to be explored, I'm all of a sudden not okay with, uh, you know, maybe some other ramifications of that. I mean, there could be legal ramifications. There could be. Or just even sentiment, you know, people just saying like, oh, these people are, you know, they supported a child killer. Um, But it goes from what they, I think they believe to uh, an arithmetic problem, two versus one, where it's just an integer with me. It's one because I own the Google account. I could see a scenario where somebody says later on, oh, you don't know that that was me making that Twitter post. There's three of us here, you know? So it's like, I have to think about that and say, how much am I really willing to be on the hook for when I don't even believe some of these core things that these guys believe anymore? 
and they're going on Twitter and, and, and saying stuff that's pretty, you know, aggressive or whatever. I, I don't personally believe that legally, you know, I, I think free speech does cover quite a bit, but that there's some areas where you could argue, you know, especially after the trial, I don't know, maybe civil stuff or whatever. I, I don't want to be, if, if I don't believe what they're saying, why should I take the, take the rap potentially, you know, I, that was, that's this more, the most simple answer to, to that as far as the, the reason why there, there's other, there's plenty of reasons. My, my understanding of things as time went on and stuff too. My, my thing, what I will say is I almost envision a future where one day they almost thank me for doing it because there's, there's a lot that they need to consider that they might, they're not aware of too. So um, I'll just kind of leave it at that. What sort of harassment have you received since you took that step? Oh yeah, no. Um, I, you know, I, I expected some pushback, I guess with that one, I will, I'll just say that I understand the pushback, but without going into too much detail, people just shouldn't cross certain lines and they, they did. I, I, I won't go into detail. Um, I, I'm not going to describe myself as a victim in that sense. Um, I, but, um, they, you know, they know what they did and, and, uh, I'll just leave it at that. I understand some of it to an extent, but yeah. I mean, you, you can't cry and stuff about certain things and, and complain about things that have happened to you. And then you turn around and you do the same thing. Like you can't do that. Like, but whatever, right. I guess it is what it is. I wanted to ask you, um, and actually before uh, I ask the next question, I, this is kind of an additional question. So I hope that's okay. It's mm -hmm. just, um, you know, with, with the unraveling, we're going to be doing some episodes on some of the, the private messages group messages within the the twitter or x account of the unravel mm -hmm. and can you just state like in terms of who was actually messaging on that platform um given that there were three people who had access to it can you just clarify who who was yes yeah, so, that's a good point because I, I guess i just assume that people know that and they certainly do not <laughs> but uh i i um even though the twitter account was in my name and I created it and everything like that. Yes. Angela did use that Twitter account quite a bit. I mean, she pretty much always did. The only time I ever kind of went on there and posted anything was just to kind of promote like a, a YouTube or something like that, whatever. But there was a DM called uh, the due process gang. And this is something that I, I, I point out because um, in tandem to what was going on with the sort of the dissolution of, of me, Courtney and Angela, uh, in our group and the unraveling at the same time, I guess how I'll say it is, well, I'll explain it like this. Um, this, this Twitter DM, there was Bob Mata, Kara Wynicke, uh, they ended up adding Michael Osbrook and Sleuthy. And I'll say one thing about Sleuthy before I go into this. <laughs> I feel like Sleuthy is very talented and I feel that if she would have gotten into the case earlier she would be i think she would have you know she would under, have a way better understanding and she has a skill set and whatever that that is valuable um but uh because she entered kind of late in the game i think that she's she doesn't understand like the the reasons why brad holder is just not the guy but it take it takes a long time to i think to understand the learning curve with with all the different iterations of, of, of Delphi and how complicated things are. But like at the first of the year, this that 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 Twitter group formed and I just kind of noticed that Courtney and Angel were spending a little bit more time in there as opposed to like our other private groups and stuff like that. And when Kara had gone on a podcast, I don't know if it was Bob Mata's podcast or something like that, she kind of had mentioned that when she was working with the defense team um, for the Supreme Court that in her interactions with Brad and Andy, that she felt that she said something along the lines of, you know, if they have what I think they have, they have a slam dunk case. So when this Twitter group formed, I'm thinking like, I'm, I'm going to, I'm going to grab my, my, my bowl of popcorn and, and, uh, you know, like the Michael Jackson meme, you know, kind of just like watch, you know? So I, I, I paid attention at first, but I just wasn't impressed. Their, 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 uh, understanding of the case was just very rudimentary. I guess what I learned in that is that you can have experience you know, as a lawyer or detective or whatever, and, and no, no offense to Kevin. I mean, I'm, I'm saying like, I, I think, I think legal expertise is great, but you additionally have to have 
uh, a decent amount of, you know, time in the case to understand. Otherwise, it's just, they're just, the stuff they were saying in there was absolutely ridiculous. And I, and, and that was another thing that kind of, it, it, it made me just kind of question, okay, yeah, the, these, this whole uh, defense maximalist position is is pretty flawed. Uh, it's it's people kind of like pushing around their their letters and their name and stuff like that, and there isn't a whole lot to it. Um, I'm trying to think of like a good example, maybe from there. I mean, just just even just Osbrook, like okay, Michael Osbrook, obviously a brilliant dude, but it's not going to add up to a whole lot if you don't do your homework and and really immerse yourself in, in the case because um, somebody who's who's maybe even following and, and shit posting on, on, on Facebook for years probably has, even if they've been wrong over and over and over again, they might have a better understanding of the case than, than, than Osbrook, given what his, his, his theory on the case is. It, it's silly. When I kind of raised those concerns to Courtney and Angela, um, I, I had said to them, Hey, can you pull these guys aside and just be like, you know, kind of knowledge them on, on, on some of these things. Cause we've been here for a minute, you know, and it, it matters. And again, their whole thing is, you don't know what information they're privy to, what what discovery they have, what they're, you know, and I'm just thinking like, no, no, like you, you know better than that. And they just, they seem to start prioritizing flashy lawyer credentials and stuff like that and, and networking and that sort of thing over the pursuit of the truth, I guess, is, is how I would kind of phrase it. Why do you think it's important for people to be aware that this happened? Um, you know, why speak out about it, I guess? The way I kind of would say that is, or, or answer that question, it's like, I always say like the cardinal sin, I think the one thing maybe everybody can agree on, the cardinal sin in, the, in this case is the, the two girls were brutally slain. Beyond that, like in the sleuthing community, and this might be kind of controversial too, but I also feel like sometimes people will hoard information and 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 not talk about it or they'll use it as leverage or something like that i've seen that happen before too i just feel like the more people talk about it the more people share you know and you know be clear about theory and fact and sometimes the line gets blurred all that but i've just always been an advocate for you know i i i've said it before i draw the line at crime scene pictures i think that that is disgusting you know i would never do that myself but um in terms of theories and and, and discussing the case that's the hoarding of it and, and using information for other reasons or whatever is, is, is the like secondary sin, but on the, on the lawyer side of it, and I never would have thought about this, but you know, the idea that somebody would, who has access to case files or whatever would manipulate that information is also a high sin. And I think that I've definitely made a lot of content being very critical of the prosecution that I, I felt at the time was valid. So if I come across information that the defense team is doing something in terms of like manipulating information, why wouldn't I call them out on it as well? And I think that people talking about things and speaking out is sort of like the, the antidote to that in a way, you know, I mean, like, uh, because the more people talk, the more people are going to realize like, Hey, like, you know, something's not adding up. So that that's, yeah, it's, it's like the only tool that people have really to, to kind of bust through that, you know? And you know, talking is good. And on a personal level, Anya and I have enjoyed having some conversations with you in recent weeks about yeah. this case. Uh, with that said, there have been times in the past we've said some critical things about you. You've said some critical things about us. Why is it important for people to be able to have respectful conversations with each other, even if they disagree about the case? Yes, absolutely. And likewise with me, I thanks for having me on here so that we can talk about this stuff. But I absolutely agree with that. Um, I think that I always refer to it as um, and, and I agree, you know, I, I, I apologize for any, you know, any crappy uh, things I might have said in the past. And that extends to, you know, people, you know, you guys, you know, I've I've recently apologized to, to Meerkat as well. Like, you know, there's been times where, you know, you get caught up in stuff and it's not an excuse, but it's just. You know, all you can do is kind of try and do better and stuff like that. And I am going to make an effort to try to, but, um, to, to get back to, uh, cause when I first came on the scene that, you know, when I first made my Reddit account, I was almost known as like more of like a peacemaker, but, uh, but you know, the, the thing is, is like the corruption thing and stuff, 
I almost felt like when I started to kind of go in the corruption um, direction, it made me more salty. Like, man, I wasted my time on this, you know, and all it was was corruption. And now that I'm starting to see, like, there might be a little bit more to it than that. And I don't know it's it's even a valid criticism. I'm just kind of getting more of like a center center of, of you know, gravity in terms of, of how I view things. But I always refer to people, and I think they people are, they tend to either, for whatever reason, they are geared towards being prosecution maximalist frame of reference versus defense maximalist frame of reference. And I think that it's good to have a counterbalance because as much as people like to think that they're, they have the ability to be objective, sometimes, you know, you, you kind of trick yourself into thinking that. And uh, if you don't have that, if you're not challenging your own questions and things like, you know, your own thought process, uh, how strong is your argument? You know what I mean? It, it, it can't be that strong if you're not going to do that. So it's just always good to have people of opposing views in, in contact. And, and you can, you can figure out a lot. Like I, in the past couple of months, since I've made an effort to be that way, I have, I feel like I've learned probably even more so than I have in the past, you know, year, uh, just, you know, it just takes that, that, that counterbalance. For folks who might feel like, I, I honestly think when I see a lot of people who are very passionate about this case or even angry about the case, I think a lot of that comes from a really good place of like wanting justice and wanting mm -hmm. Things to be fair and I, I think it comes from like a a real sincere sincere want for that and i think that's that's how i i view you now and that's also how i view a lot of other people who might be caught up in stuff that maybe started good and maybe got a bit toxic or whatnot mm -hmm. um what would your advice be for someone who might feel like they're caught up in something like that in, in the true crime space and may feel like i want to do things differently but i don't really know how to start like what would your what are your thoughts on that I think that just as like a, a standard sort of approach to things, you know, if you get to a certain point and you feel too confident, I think people should kind of reassess, reevaluate and be like, yeah, just at like challenge your challenge, your strongest theories. And if you need to reach out to somebody, even, I mean, somebody maybe go through the whole list of content creators that you probably would think are complete opposite of yourself and be like, Hey, maybe I should just reach out and just see if they'll talk to me. And, and I don't know, I, I see a lot of stuff right now on YouTube. That's actually pretty cool. Um, people that you've just never seen kind of engaging in discussion, uh, being a little bit more open to that. I think that's great. Just a more well-rounded, robust discussion in some cases, there's always going to be peripheral drama and things like that going on and you can't control it. You can't, you know, it, it, it is what it is. Um, but yeah, make an effort. I think people, sh people need to make an effort to, uh, be uncomfortable, I guess, in, in certain situations. I think that that would go a far distance in this case. Agreed. And, uh, one thing I wanted to ask is just in terms of Angela and Courtney, do you believe that they're being used by this defense team? And, and what are your concerns around that? I, I, I am very angry at both of them for, for personal reasons. With that being said, and I don't want to like, you know, infantilize them and, and, and make it seem like they don't have their own ability to, to make choices because they certainly do. But I have, I definitely have multiple years in the case of Courtney and then almost two years with, with Angela even of conversations and things where they are not being horrible humans, you know, they, they, the entire time anyways. I mean, nobody's perfect, but I do think that for the most part, like you had said, they're, they're, they're well-intentioned, but the problem is, and I, and this is where I do place a lot of blame on somebody like Matt Hoffman, who is enabling, you know, and, and there's, there's certainly, uh, a, a, uh, there's Angela. I, I learned, I learned a, a new word a couple days ago. Um, I was listening to Martin Scarelli and he had said, uh, what did, what did he say? Polemic, polemical. <laughs> I never heard that word before, but that's, that's Angela sort of has a, like a polemical quality about her and it's, there's not a lot behind it. It's just, she's, I, you know, so when you see something like that and you, you, you kind of embolden them and you kind of light the fuse there's in, yeah, there's blame to go around, but, but the way I see what they're, what the defense team is doing, at least uh, Matt Hoffman is, he kind of came into 
a situation where I think he thought he was going to manipulate some people in the YouTube community and use it to his advantage. And I'm, I'm so sick and tired of hearing this, this excuse for stuff like that, where it's like, well, the defense team, it's what they do, you know, like that, that's, you know, they have to raise suspicion of doubt. Okay. Well, that's different than creating it. You know, like you, you don't have to create a fake situation or something like that. Uh, and then ju try to justify it. Um, but on top of that, again, it's, it's the destruction of some of these people and what it's doing to them that should be enough to just be like, I got to stop doing this because, or try to find some other way there. The defense teams need to, to defend Allen over that. It, it doesn't mean shit to me. Like I don't have to adhere to the rules that they, some people might look at what I'm doing right now and just be like, I can't believe you're doing all this. Well, he shouldn't have, he shouldn't have, you know, d jumped in the pool then because he, Matt Hoffman, if, if what they're alleging is true, he, he put his neck on the line by doing this, right? Like he thought, you know, he's going to, you know, achieve whatever he was trying to achieve. And the YouTube community and the, the creator content or the creator community, we don't have, you know, we want the truth. Okay. Like most people, I think sincerely are really there to, to know what happened. The idea that that, that he is going to hijack that and, and achieve some other kind of outcome is, is preposterous to me. Like he, he should know better or he, or, you know, well, he's going to find out that that's not, that's not how it's going to happen. Well said. I mean, I'm going to tell you this. It is the defense's job absolutely to um, vigorously pursue a, a defense of Allen. And that means convincing a jury of his innocence um, or, or convincing a jury that the state did not prove its case. Uh, it does not mean that they have to go try to manipulate people and right. water uh, to them. And, and frankly, some of the stuff we saw in, in the private messages that we will talk about, even from the lawyers, just smacks of um, people who know better manipulate right. people who that's, don't. That's what I, exactly. And that's what I'm saying. Like, there's, yeah, there's, there's definitely like this feeling that they're taking, you know, if, if, if this, this is an economy of, of validation in terms of what some of these content creators want from these lawyers or these YouTube lawyers or however you want to say it, that, that they're getting and they're thinking that they're going to pull a fast one. It's like, this is a different rule set. Like we don't like they're, they're putting a lot of risk on the line for, for how they're choosing to engage this, this case. I, I feel, uh, because at the end of the day, we're going to question things that they might not want to answer. And that's all there is to it. You know, it, it's, uh, yeah, that's how I see it anyways. I'm curious, uh, before we wrap, can you tell us a little bit about your own philosophy about how people should be researching and discussing this case? I guess like kind of how I've said, you know, it's just, I feel like every single thing that I've ever done, at least from my perspective, to the best of my uh, abilities is to kind of enrich the the conversation as best as I can. I try to, like I said in um, the opening question, I try to remove myself from any kind of expectations or anything like that. Like if, for instance, you know, like I spent a lot of time on being critical of, of the prosecution based on some things that, you know, I had been told and, and thought at the time. Um, there's no reason why I wouldn't do the same thing for towards the defense team. Um, it's just the best obligation that I can make to trying to find the truth. You know what I mean? It, I just, I don't, I try not to veer from that, but yeah, like even in simpler terms than that, in terms of time, right? Like you, you kind of allocate how much time you're going to use in your day. You know, you're going to go to the gym, you're going to go shopping, you're going to pay bills, whatever. And then you're like, well, at this time, I'm going to spend a couple hours, you know, looking in, to some stuff about Delphi or whatever, but that dopamine circuit for that to kind of complete, it's probably got like its own flavor. And to me, it just has to be about getting to the closest approximation of the truth. And it's never going to be, oh, I want to talk to this person and, and, or, you know, impress this person or whatever, you know, it, it's got to be about getting to th the best answers as, as you can. And that, that's pretty much, that's pretty much how I look at it, you know? Um, I wanted to ask you to wrap up um, to kind of a two part question. One is what do you hope to see going forward in the Delphi case around the online discourse or anything else? And um, 
didn't is there just anything we didn't ask you about that you wanted to mention that uh, we forgot about? I guess the basic answer to that is answers. <laughs> that's just that's that's it. Like I I think everybody wants to know are we going to get them uh, in some form or fashion in a trial or otherwise? I hope we do. And yeah, no, I I think you guys asked the right questions. Um, good questions, great questions. Um, oh, one thing that I didn't, I guess maybe I didn't um, make clear. So I have a feeling, well, why they are doing what they're doing is still kind of a mystery to me. You know what I mean? Like, are they doing it out of necessity because Alan is maybe guilty and they don't have any way of, is this Odinism thing something that they had to, or as crazy as it sounds, that might actually be preferable to a scenario where maybe Alan really, there is reason to believe Alan is innocent and they still chose this silly thing just because they thought it was uh, more effective or um, with, with the Odinism stuff uh, or it was more beneficial to their careers somehow. I don't know. Um, but um, that that is one thing. I have a question for you guys, though. Yeah, hit us. <laughs> Uh-oh. This is just something... <laughs> No, no. Um, yeah. I, uh, so I guess, okay, let's say they were going to create like a, a movie version of, of Delphi and then uh, for the Delphi murders and you were tasked with creating like a cold open scene that kind of was a key moment in the case or whatever to kind of uh, maybe show like a really key, like sort of game changer moment. Like, where maybe not a whole lot of words are said or something like that. Like what, how would you, what what would you choose? I mean, I know that's kind of a complicated question, but. That's <laughs> no, a good question though. And I'm, I feel like I'm going to come up with something really uncreative and boring. Um, but no, it's a good question. I've often thought about, it, it feels sort of in some ways. I should have probably like asked you guys. Oh, and, no, and no, told no, you ahead no. of time. We're going to pull something out of here. Uh, let me think. I mean, to me, this is boring. This is really boring. But when I when I think of like where you have to begin with a story, I, I feel like I don't know. I, I, if you could somehow shoot it in a way that you could capture how terrifying that bridge is, mm -hmm. that's something that's not captured when you're looking at the pictures of just like the planks going forward. It looks sure. pretty solid. It looks pretty normal. Mm -hmm. um, I think when you go under it, you see this like thin towering almost tottering um just it it's a scary bridge and i i th to me i don't know i i, I think i would i would want to go to that image uh, that's great that's a great answer i i feel like that is yeah because it it it, it yeah no have you I, been I agree. there have you been there um to the bridge oh yeah i i went there before they they redid it and i so yeah i i i, I walked it my my wife walked right up to the edge of it and she's because we were joking the entire time we were going up there and she's like you're not going to cross it i said yeah i will and she walked and she completely stopped and i just always give her crap about it because but people who don't want to cross it and i think it's 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 such a key insight because yeah the fact that what happened happened it tells you a lot and i feel like you're you're right yeah and, and it and it, it that's a great that is a great it uh, opening. So sad. I remember the first time we went there, we went underneath. We've never crossed it. I have, I have no intention to because I'm terrified of heights. But I remember like what you're saying. Like I I got really like emotional and sad because mm -hmm. I just thought of how trapped they must have felt up there. Absolutely. Um, and it's like you know you kind of it just I don't know just that kills me. Um, that really mm -hmm. was upsetting. Yeah, it's heartbreaking. It's it's really yeah. Are you I gonna agree. Say, uh, Kevin or do you have one yourself? Uh, I would probably just try to center the uh, two girls, maybe have them in the car with Kelsey going there, smiling and happy, listening mm -hmm. to music. And it's just that's a great one, too. Yeah. That and between what happens next. Yeah, I, I think often in our discussions about the case, they get lost. That's true. They, no, they... I understand that. Yeah, that's true, too. How about you? Oh, man, I've I've, I've gone over this like a bunch of times. I don't know. I guess it depends on like what happens. I've thought of a weird thing where like, if, if let's say Alan, you know, ends up being the guy, like if there's some weird Christmas where he receives like a present, he opens it up and there's like a blue jacket in the, in the present, you know, or something like that. 
or even just uh, something where they're all the investigators and people on the scene are kind of just analyzing and just kind of like dismayed at what they're seeing. And then all of a sudden something happens and they kind of all like have this like moment of realization about something. I don't know. Just, just, uh, it's an interesting question. There's so many great possibilities. Yeah. Yeah. No, there is. Yeah. That's why I always, I, I'm interested to see like what, what, what people's thoughts are on that. But, um, kind of goes at the heart of how do you convey this really complicated story in a way that makes sense because it, it, it can be hard. Like sometimes I feel like I worry that our episodes about Delphi, we're kind of just jumping in. Okay, like, okay, here's Richard Allen. Here's this person. And like, I mean, are people even following along half the time? Cause like, it's like, there's so many moving parts. There's been different suspects that come up over the years. There's mm -hmm. been different theories. There's been different just things. I mean, there's so many moving pieces in like how, Absolutely. you know, and I think, I mean, that's why we appreciate what, what you're saying and, and sort of just how candid you are and how, um, much you know i feel like you put in a lot of thoughtfulness to a lot of your answers here and just kind of like coming at it from like a looking at the whole thing and analyzing it um not just the case but also true crime in general and like mm -hmm. we love to do to, that yeah. and so we really appreciate you kind of coming on and doing that with us too no absolutely and i i like i said to you guys before like the thing that i like to do most is just talk about the case and and see what people think and and that's all that I require. I require in terms of people who, you know, I want to talk to and stuff like that. Like anybody who has an opinion, I love to hear it. I just, it's just always been a fascinating case to me. Everything like the, the case itself, the online culture around it. It's, there's so many different, yeah, like you said, it's, it's complicated and it's, it's messy, but it's, uh, it's always just been very interesting to me. Absolutely. Uh, well, listen, thank you so much for joining us again, Paul. I will say when we talk to you about the case, it does feel like a kind of a throwback to the times when we were kind of just like starting to look into it, talking mm -hmm. about the news. And there's something very nice about that because refreshing. it's refreshing. Because Exactly. It's like, I feel the same way. Yeah, so it's mutual because, right. yeah. Um, the only thing I'm going to say too is uh, look out for um, the domain that is going to be the new uh, revamped channel. Um, some people aren't going to be too happy, but some people are going to be, you know, they're going to have to accept it anyway. So, but thanks for having me on guys. I appreciate it. Appreciate you, Paul. Thank you so much. All right. We want to sincerely thank Paul for taking the time to speak with us today. And we look forward to seeing whatever it was he was hinting there at the end about the future of his channel. Yes. We're very, very curious and interested, and we'll certainly be checking that out. Thank you all for listening as well. Thanks so much for listening to The Murder Sheet. If you have a tip concerning one of the cases we cover, please email us at murdersheet at gmail.com. If you have actionable information about an unsolved crime, please report it to the appropriate authorities. If you're interested in joining our Patreon, that's available at www.patreon.com slash murdersheet. If you want to tip us a bit of money for records requests, you can do so at www.buymeacoffee.com slash murder sheet. We very much appreciate any support. Special thanks to Kevin Tyler Greenley, who composed the music for the murder sheet, and who you can find on the web at kevintg.com. If you're looking to talk with other listeners about a case we've covered, you can join the Murder Sheet discussion group on Facebook. We mostly focus our time on research and reporting, so we're not on social media much. We do try to check our email account, but we ask for patience as we often receive a lot of messages. Thanks again for listening. If you're shopping while working, eating, or even listening to this podcast, then you know and love the thrill of the hunt. But are you getting the thrill of the best deals? Rakuten shoppers do. They get the brands they love with the most savings and cash back. And you can get it too. Start getting cash back at your favorite stores like Urban Outfitters, Samsung, and Adidas. And even stack sales on top of cash back. It's easy to use and you get your cash back through PayPal or check. 
The idea is simple. Stores pay Rakuten for sending them shoppers, and Rakuten shares the money with you as cash back. Download the free Rakuten app and never miss a deal. Or go to Rakuten.com to start getting the most bang for your buck. That's R-A-K-U-T-E-N.